case that some of those people left the service because they were unhappy that, of the situation that was occurring at that police station and they didn't feel uh, like the, the, their concerns about how Benjamin Price was allowed to get away with what he did were being treated seriously enough. Can I say to you that I, um, that's the first I've heard that um, and also can I say to you that that isn't specifically within my knowledge and I couldn't comment on that matter. Oh, no, I don't. You said at least yesterday when we were told, up until today, we've been told there were five who quit and yes. three who are under internal investigation. Now, today you're saying there's at least three. How many are there? Oh, I, I can't speculate on that. What I can say to you is, is that at the present time, uh, there are at least three officers, um, and I need to leave the, uh, the door open that potentially is a result of the investigation. That might lead to, uh, to further people. I'm sorry, I can't speculate on that. I don't have that knowledge. What about the whistleblowers? Do you commend them? Are they, are they urged to come forward on something like this? Or? Yes, yes, they are. And they're um, incredibly well supported when they do um, internally. Um, one of my portfolio responsibilities uh, is uh, responsible for the internal witness support unit. And I can tell you that from the moment uh, this uh, young woman came forward, and she is heroic, uh, I want to be perfectly clear with respect to her uh, she met the organisational expectation and she exceeded it. She did everything that I would expect of her. And I have personally, I have personally been in contact with her and I have commended her for the temerity and her bravery in terms of coming forward with respect to this matter. And I would expect uh, people, um, and, and she heralds to a large degree a new uh, uh, breed of officer that uh, are prepared these days to step, uh, to step up and meet their obligations. And as I said, 3,000 or so complaints in the course of a year, 25% of those are internally generated police officer and staff member making a complaint against another police officer and staff member. What's happened to her? <clears throat> well, she is now working in another area for the, uh, the organisation. Uh, she's doing incredibly productive work. Uh, I would think that her career looks incredibly bright. Um, she's a very intelligent, uh, astute uh, uh, police officer and uh, we're very fortunate to have her and uh, people like her. If that occurred, and I have to say to you that I'm incredibly uh, sceptical that that would occur, I have to say to you that um, that is a small price to pay having regard for the fact that we are an organisation that is transparent uh, and accountable uh, and we're open. Uh, we don't always get it right and in those cases where we don't get it right then we uh, try wherever we can to, to be on the front foot, to be open and accountable and transparent. And on this particular issue we've done uh, all of those things. I, I think that there is uh, this particular issue it is in the public interest that we disclose. Uh, it is in the public interest that we uh, that we release this particular uh, image, uh, and this uh, was uh, part of our considerations when uh, ultimately doing that. Well, part of the part of the uh, exhibit that was played in, in a public uh, setting in an open court was also an audio track um, with the uh, assault on Tim Steele. Why was that not released? Can I say to you that uh, with respect to the two uh, pieces of uh, video? that were played as part of the, uh, the criminal proceeding. Uh, there was a problem with both of those. Uh, the first one, um, there was one particular um, uh, incident whereby the sound was compromised by virtue of the fact that there was um, a, uh, music being played in the background. Normally what happens is the police officers suspend the music and that's a normal uh, part of uh, watch house practice. The music was uh, designed to be suspended so that the audio could be picked up. In this particular case it wasn't. So what it did was it imprinted the, uh, the sound of the, the music over the particular um, uh, uh, audio stream related to the, uh, the video. In the, the second and subsequent one, uh, what occurred was the, um, the audio picked up conversations that were not only uh, unique to the particular transaction that was occurring in the assault that was occurring at that particular time. So what it did was it picked up conversation with a person at the charge counter, a completely separate, uh, disparate conversation that was occurring somewhere else. Uh, and these were quite personal matters relating to a person's mental health conditions and, and health uh, issues uh, as part of normal watch house procedures. Uh, that was the reason. Can I also say to you that our personal view was that it was the, it was the image, it was the vision that was the story, not the sound. Yep. That, we have identified that person because that would be the only legal impediment to release 
Uh, I think there were significant privacy issues uh, surrounding that, and the decision was taken corporately uh, to, uh, and in the interests of, uh, it, it could have taken quite some time to resolve those particular issues. It was a case of let's uh, let's get the uh, the vision out. We needed to do that, and uh, what that meant was that the best, most expeditious way to do that was to ultimately uh, uh, remove the compromised uh, audio part of that particular uh, piece. I'm sorry, I, I can't comment on that. Uh, the, uh, my investigator that had carriage of this particular matter was in the precincts of the court, uh, but that's not within my knowledge and I can't comment on that, I'm sorry. I, I can say to you though that I have heard the, uh, the particular audio uh, files um, and that um, I believe that um, ultimately to have released those in their, in their current uh, shape, one would have been unproductive and second, um, I have concerns about the privacy issues with respect to the other person who was completely separate from this particular matter. No, I don't. I don't think it's good PR. My preference would have been for this never to have occurred. Um, and it, in terms of a pub public relations uh, exercise, it's a, it's a nightmare. Um, I've got to say to you, I would have much preferred this not to have occurred. Um, that would be my, uh, uh, my very firm position. But can I say to you that um, we don't have a, a say as to whether or not um, this is um, a good public relations. Uh, we are an open, accountable and transparent organisation. Uh, when we uh, identify these particular matters, we need to, to get that message out. And on this particular occasion, we've done that. And I think that we've done that very expeditiously and we've done that professionally. The CCTV footage obviously shows Price's illegal behaviour. Um, are there random checks of police uh, CCTV footage at, um, at branches around Queensland, or should there be? Uh, yes, that, that's a very good point. And uh, the short answer to that is. Uh, we certainly have an expectation that supervisors, uh, commission officers and uh, other people in authority as part of the normal inspection and audit program uh, uh, review in a random way uh, the CCTV footage from places like uh, watch houses uh, and other uh, critical areas. Uh, and uh, that is also part of the inspection uh, regime that uh, is looked at centrally as well. Uh, no, not at this stage, I can't, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I can't make any comments about that by virtue of the fact that I don't know when that uh, vision was inspected and what have you. But what, what I can say is that there's probably no more regulated, more highly regulated environment than a watch house or a prison. And we're very fortunate that in these particular matters we were able to go back to uh, the CCTV and to, uh, to use that within the, uh, the context of the, uh, the investigation. All of the supervisory issues that relate to this particular matter are part of our reference now with respect to those systemic uh, broader issues that I spoke about as part of that third phase of the, the investigation. You said it shouldn't take long, this next part of the internal investigation. Can you put a, a time on it? No, no I can't. Uh, to, to do so would be, um, uh, would be flawed having regard for the fact that I'm un, uh, unaware specifically of the, the vagaries of this particular investigation in terms of um, you know, who's left to be interviewed and what have you. I can say though is that the investigation is well advanced having regard for the, uh, the criminal uh, matters that have clearly been pursued and have been resolved recently and that many of the issues that have fallen out of that are now part of the, uh, the ongoing um, uh, disciplinary investigation. Uh, at, at this stage, no. Are you happy with the sentence? Uh, issues with respect to court sentences are not matters that I can comment on. Um, and, and you, naturally enough, would, uh, would understand that um, um, there is an appeal period. Uh, that appeal period is still current uh, and that, that would be really unwise for me in terms of, um, one, to make a comment generally, and secondly, I would never be critical of uh, the court process in terms of what might have occurred. Can you understand why some people would feel the Queensland Police is that material now? 
I, I, I don't hold that view. Um, I, I can understand that some people would uh, would think that that was the case. I, I would think that that would probably be a fairly mean-spirited view, having regard for the fact that we put the vision out there, and we put the vision out there voluntarily. We weren't uh, drug into a process, uh, kicking and screaming. We did that voluntarily. We did that for the very right reasons. My view is that the telling story here is the story with respect to the matter that's on the public record that went to the court process. But more importantly is the, uh, the fact that uh, we were uh, able to put out the vision and that we had vision and that we were able to get it out there um, uh, so quickly after the event. And I think that that's the issue that we need to focus on. And I think that uh, from that perspective that uh, we've met the, uh, the, uh, the organ uh, the, both the organisational expectation and also the community's expectation with respect to this. Could, could I just make, could I just make a, a closing comment? And it's something that, that I've, uh, I've picked up in recent uh, uh, media interviews with respect to the, uh, the union's view with respect to this issue. And, and the point that I'd make is the, um, and, and, this is around, and this is around comments that the union have made with respect to uh, the police service and particularly the commissioner and senior members of the organisation not recognising the inherent uh, dangers and issues that police officers encounter. And it would be remiss of me not to make the point that the vast majority of police officers, and the figures quoted 99.9, is actually higher than that. Uh, the vast, vast majority of police officers, and this particular issue was a complete aberration, I've got to say to you. But the vast majority of police officers are very good and decent police officers that joined for the very right reasons. Um, they're hard working, they work in very, very difficult contexts. And the organisation, I would think, recognises their hard work. Um, that this particular person, and his actions at this, uh, on this occasion should be seen in no way to, be, uh, to exemplify the fine work that occurs from one end of Queensland to the other and the rapport that, the, uh, that those police officers have with their, uh, with their community. And I would hope that the community would see that in this particular case that the actions of the, uh, the service um, were uh, responsive, were measured and were appropriate, were consistent with issues of legitimacy and accountability, but moreover in no way did the actions of this officer reflect the attitude or the industry of the vast majority of Queensland Police Service officers. Can I just before you run away, the, uh, in the video you see the, another officer hand the hose to Christ. In our civilian world, if I handed a hose to somebody who then shoved it in someone's throat and they claimed the person claimed they almost drowned, I'd be charged. Why is that second officer not facing criminal charges? Um, the short answer to that is not necessarily uh, would you be charged. It would depend upon the circumstances and the point that I would make to you is that that is very much applicable to this particular case. It's the circumstances and it's the knowledge and it's the contribution and it's those factors that were operating on the mind of that individual at the time that are factors that were taken into account when considering potentially criminal charges. Can I say to you that, um, that uh, my view, and from the evidence that we've elicited from uh, that particular matter, there is insufficient to institute criminal proceedings against any um, of uh, the officers, um, except for the officer that was charged and dealt with in the court. Again, can, can I thank you uh, for your interest in this particular matter, and, uh, and certainly uh, the, uh, your responsiveness to it. Uh, and certainly it uh, demonstrates uh, to us that uh, this is a very uh, significant issue and it's one that we've uh, treated seriously. So thank you most, uh, most sincerely.